You're listening to The Founder, a show that features entrepreneurs and their early stories of ingenuity, struggle, and perseverance to get their companies off the ground. We do our best to capture the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when getting started. If you're new to the show, thanks so much for giving us a listen. We're super grateful to have you and hope what you learn here will inspire you in your own life. My guest today is the founder of Cleveland Cookie Dough Company and soon to be Remix. Cleveland Cookie Dough Company serves edible cookie dough and selected ice creams from their bright pink food truck and can be found throughout Cleveland, Ohio and at select festivals and catered events. In addition to Cleveland Cookie Dough, this founder is in the middle of launching her second business, Remix, a brick and mortar ice cream experience that will allow a customer to select from a variety of cereals, chocolates, and candies and blend it with ice cream to create a custom soft serve McFlurry type concoction. Our guest today founded Cleveland Cookie Dough in 2018 and has seen impressive growth in the last 18 months. With Cleveland Cookie Dough on the rise and Remix launching soon, she is a force to be reckoned with. Without further ado, the founder of Cleveland Cookie Dough Company and Remix, Vicky Kotris. Let's get it. Vicky, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm trying to frame the show as the, the uncensored, uncovered look behind the curtain into what founders really face when they get started. I think there's there's a lot of, I mean, me included, there's a lot of young and aspiring entrepreneurs out there that could really benefit from hearing like the straight talk, real experiences, the ups and downs that founders go through. And uh, and I'm super excited to learn about it as well. So let's uh, let's dive in. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. So before we go into the business side of it, I kind of want to start with your background just to just to help contextualize kind of what you did growing up, what you were interested in, um, and what kind of things you you did as a kid. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll point out that nepotism helps with everything in life. And so for your listeners, we're cousins. So we grew up similar. You know, we, we grew up in Cleveland. We had really nice upbringings. And I think one of the things that set my childhood experience apart is I grew up with a twin. And so I think a lot of things that I did in my life were to differentiate myself from always being in this like, you know, double type scenario. And so I liked um, different things. I I always loved music and I loved performing and um, I was much of a sports buff and I'm still not. But, (laughs) um, you know, it was just um, a very normal upbringing. Awesome. And would you say, were you exposed? I know when, when we were growing up, entrepreneurship wasn't like as sexy or as popular of a thing. Like there are obviously people that own the local businesses, but nothing like as, as kind of almost celebritized as it is today. Were you exposed yeah. to that? Did you ever kind of see people that were entrepreneurs and, and get intrigued? You know, that that's what's funny. And I, I was thinking a lot about this recently, but there's no one in our family that's a business owner. At least when we were growing up, I didn't, there wasn't anyone directly that I knew. It's not like, you know, my parents had a shop and I worked in it every single day. So I wasn't exposed to small businesses and I'm learning today now just what people have to go through to, to start things and and grow from nothing. But I, I think, you know, not having that exposure then so much has changed now as an adult. And I truly think I was born in the right era and the right generation because, you know, you can sit at your computer and you can do work for someone that's, 3000 miles away from you and create your own job from sitting in your living room and using technology to do that. And that's what I think has changed is the definition of small businesses or business in general has changed and become so scalable as technology has grown. And that's a really cool thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it's never been, it's never been easier to get started and it's never been easier to reach customers. Exactly. That's awesome. I want to talk about, so when you were transitioning from like high school to college, when you went to college, what was your approach? Like, what, what did you focus on? What did you study? And, and I think the reason why it's interesting is as you kind of transitioned from college and then started working up until when you founded Cleveland Cookie Dough, what, what were you working on? What were you focused on? What kind of skills were you developing? What college taught me was not entirely what I'm doing today. And, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the duality of my life today, but Um, It wasn't the classes that I went to. It wasn't the routine that I got into, but it was 
the building relationships and understanding how to network and understanding how to kind of be a part of a greater community. So when I went to college, I didn't know what, I, I, I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to be a lawyer. And those are very clear cut paths. So I went into communications because I like to talk a lot and I thought I would figure it out. And that's, that's really exactly what I did is I just took little pieces and nuggets of the things that I liked from college and knew that I was going to use that and whatever it is that I chose to explore in the future. For sure. And then you, so you transitioned, you're in sales now as well yeah. as being a founder. Were you in sales the entire time post-college or did you work, did you start out doing something else? Yeah, no, I did. I, so I've been in, I've been in sales over 10 years and it's something that even when we were in college, a lot of my friends shied away from. It's the fear of, oh, I don't want to be rejected or I don't want to you know, go in and be like the sleazy car salesman. And because sales is all I've ever known, how I look at it is again, back to that relationship building is everyone has something of value to offer to someone else. It's how you present that. It's how you sell it. That's going to make you excel in, in whatever your position is. Or if you're a founder, you're a business owner, um, you have to be able to convey the value of what you have and who you are. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And I know, so you went, you did a program for gra- around graphic design or design somewhere along the way. Yeah. And and I don't know, I'd, I'd love for you to share at the point where you were exploring doing that, were you thinking there's another kind of skill set in a different realm that I want to develop and move into full time? Or did you kind of want to, in, you know, add a tool to your toolkit? Is that kind of how, how you were thinking about that? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a little bit of everything. And I think that it's, it comes down to why I started my business, which was utter boredom. It was (laughs) doing the same thing every single day. You know, we, as, as human beings, we get really good at something and we get very comfortable. And that is what we seek. We seek comfort and we should want to, but a lot of the things that I started to do in my twenties was to um, challenge myself to find different things that I could be good at. You know, I'm good with people, but maybe I can explore graphic design or I can explore marketing and these other facets of myself. And, and, you know, being able to do that, I think is what led me to to be a more of like a multifaceted business owner. For sure. And and have you felt like that having, like you do, I'm sure you do a lot of the content marketing and all of, all of the social for Cleveland Cookie Dough now. Do you feel like that skill set is just just paid for itself in droves, have, being able to do that yourself. Yeah. And the other thing is that YouTube University is like the, yeah, best, the best tool that anyone can use. Like you want to start a podcast, you want to learn how to use Adobe Illustrator, watch a 25 minute course on YouTube, not even 25 minutes, you know, like seven minutes Yeah, and you can learn so many things. And that's the, I started to pick up those little things along the way of how to build a launch strategy and how to, um, you know, create social media content through YouTube and through other, uh, other avenues, because those, that's just what your, your business requires. You can't hire for every position that you need. So you kind of have to do everything. Yeah, absolutely. And I I've noticed your social has gotten, has leveled up in the last like three to six months or so. Like I've noticed, it seems like you have more like intention around the strategy behind it, as well as just the overall content. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's, I think that I've gotten more focused on connection on it goes back to that value of what are people getting it's not um you know we we're we work in the food industry where it's very transactional you come in we give you a product and and we hope that you come back but um i think we have to be we do have to be more intentional we do have to connect more with our audience if we want our you know transaction rate to increase for sure awesome so the way, and I, because it's the first episode, I feel like it's worth explaining a bit, but the, the way I'm, I'm potentially trying to structure these is kind of around topics, right? So a lot of the kind of founder entrepreneurial podcasts are mostly chronologically based around the story, which I, which I think will naturally come out, but I'm yeah. really interested in making sure that we hit on for the aspiring entrepreneurs and people who want to learn the kind of topics by topic. So the first one that I'm, I'm interested in exploring is kind of the, the genesis, or like the spark for the idea. So Talk us through kind of, was there a, an aha moment? Obviously the cookies, cookie dough, those are things that a lot of people consume, but the way you, yeah. you serve it is different. So was there an aha moment or did you see a trend? Kind of how did the spark for the idea come? Yeah. Okay. So, well, it, it all kind of comes together of like, I'm like, 
I'm like swimming along, like I'm bored at my job. I need something else to do. And then there's like these trends that are happening and like everything kind of like came to this perfect, it like fusion of ideas and opportunities at the same time. So a couple of years ago when I was having this like quarter life crisis of what am I going to do? Like if I have to work for 40 more years, I better make it fun and I'm I better there. I'm there right make now. it interesting. Right. I mean, that's a lot of time to be bored. So I thought, well, you know, there, I, I have a, a job that I'm really, really good at, but let's explore what a side hustle could be. And I mean, you know, just as well as I do is a side hustle is this really like buzzword term. Now everyone does something. If you're Ubering on the side or you're, I don't, anything, anything you can do. So I knew I wanted to create something. And at the time, my husband, Steve was kind of having the same, he was having the same feelings and it just was perfect that we had it at the same time that we were both like, what's next. So, um, we went to New York on vacation and we saw there was an edible cookie dough shop and we thought this was the coolest thing we had ever seen. And, and everyone relates to desserts. You know, it's an easy product to sell. There's not a lot that goes into that. And so when we came home and we're honestly like had a couple beers and we're deciding, well, <laughs> what are we going to do? What does our life look like? Um, one of my friends always describes it as how to architect your life. So we were like, how are we going to architect our, our own life? And we're throwing ideas against the wall. Like, what could we do? And we thought, well, we love festivals. We love concerts. What's always there? Food trucks. We can make it a hobby. We do it on nights and weekends. We have a good time. We're, you know, we're doing already the same things we like. We're just making money. And because we had just seen this cookie dough, you know, concept in New York, we thought it doesn't exist in Cleveland. Let's, let's just go for it. So we bought a truck we never drove, which I don't <laughs> recommend to anybody. Uh, we started a business we had knew nothing about. And so it, you know, to talk about this idea of the, the genesis of your business, the biggest, I guess, piece of advice or recommendation I can give is just start before you're ready because you'll never have the answers. If you have a cool idea, you can put some passion behind it, then you have, you continue that passion, the rest will fall into place and you'll get better, but you just got to start. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah, absolutely. So an, a, a question I have on that is around kind of like trend sensing. So mm-hmm. I've noticed that a lot of VCs and like private equity people always talk about like pattern recognition and a pattern that I, I see are people kind of chase building businesses around trends and the length of those trends like 10, 15 years ago might've been five, 10 years before they faded out. Now trends because of social media and constant gratification, it seems like trends phase in and out so much faster. Yeah. So early on, were you considering, okay, this serving size of cookie dough was yeah. a trend on the uprising and, and were you considering how long that trend might last? Or did you think, look, yeah. this market's booming. If we just grab a piece of it now, we can build a sustainable like dessert business down the road. Yeah. I think, um, if you look at just the history of how pop culture trends happen, they always start on the coast and then they start moving inward. And so I think what we saw is that, um, I don't want to say Cleveland is the last to know cool things, but we're, we're not always on, you know, the, 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 the front of the line there. And so when we went to New York and we noticed nothing was like that in Cleveland, but we saw them in Phoenix, in California, in Miami. And we thought it's going to, that, that trend is just going to start to move inward towards the Midwest. So that was part of it. But Kyle, the funny thing is, is that I didn't care two years ago. I didn't care. This, this business was not a, um, a big picture. How are we going to scale? How are we going to make a million dollars? It was, how are we going to end our, our professional boredom? How are we going to create something that we feel is bigger than ourselves? And then, and then we'll figure it out. Yeah, for sure. That's what we, I think that that didn't scare me too much in the beginning, but now as we invest more money and invest more time, sure. It, 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 we are more aware of it. Right. Um, but we'll just kind of see what happens. And that's, that's such a critical, that's such a critical piece is like not being afraid to just take 10 steps when you're on step one, you don't know what's in front of step two or three, but you just start taking steps. And then before you know it, you have a snowball rolling downhill. Yeah. Yeah. People get so afraid. And that's kind of another thing in this, in this topic that I wanted to talk about is around like self-doubt. 
So I feel like a lot of people, and this happens to me too, you come up with ideas, you may, the majority of people come up with the idea, leave it. And then some people take the first couple steps, but then they get scared of either what other people will think, what happens if I fail, even what happens if I succeed, like I don't have the infrastructure in place to, to support it. Did that come into play with you guys at all? Or were you just kind of having fun with it at the beginning? And then d- did it ever since you started come into play? Oh, it still does. I don't know anybody who doesn't feel afraid of one thing or another. And I'm going to share this because this changed my, my perspective on, on fear of staying the same, fear of change, fear of everything. But I read this book called Big Magic by okay. Elizabeth Gilbert a few years ago. And she describes, she describes fear as like a living entity. Like it will always be there. It doesn't go away. Like it's all like, you have to treat it like a friend or like a child that you put to bed. Like, okay, I realize that you're here, but I'm going to live my life. And like, I'm going to do what I want to do. And so that totally changed my perspective because I thought if fear is going to be here anyway, like, fuck it, I'm just going to do what I want to do. And, and I, I can't be afraid. I am, I mean, I am a lot of the time, but I just do it anyway. And I think if you tell yourself that people will, people are not going to remember something stupid that you do or a stupid social media post. So just, just do it. I'm curious to understand, like in the process of coming up with the idea and making the first prototype, there's kind of two schools of thought that I've experienced. One is you come up with the idea, you think it's so great, you're afraid someone's gonna steal it, so you keep it tight, only in your like tight circle until you're ready. The other mm-hmm. side is share it with as many people for validation, both early excitement and to like pressure test the concept. Did you start talking to people, friends and family about the idea and like how deep did you go and what at what stage was that at before you kind of started yeah. making the product? I think there is a happy medium. Yeah. I honestly do between not telling the world and not keeping it so close that you can't even, you can't even get some like valid criticism. But, but I will say this, the funny thing is is that when we launched our business within three weeks, a competitor launched at the same time, Cleveland is not a big city. Do you think that was reactive or proactive on their part? Like they just happened to, or do you think it was reactive? I have theories about, about, and it goes back to who do you want to tell and how do you want to, to make sure that your launch is well thought out. But it it was, it was a weird time for us. And I mean, we were, we spent the whole summer testing recipes and building our branding and figuring out, you know, what, how everything was going to look and feel once we launched our business. So that took some time, but we were going so far as we were asking people who worked for us to sign NDAs. And now I look back and I think like, we're a food business. You know, we don't, we don't have the recipe to Coca-Cola. Like, I don't yeah. know why we you, might, you might soon. You never know. Yeah, you never, you know. never know. So we did that. But then towards the end, like as soon as we, we did a kind of a soft launch, we were taking samples to every party that we went to, you know, we were sending our branding out to our friends to just kind of gauge what everybody's thoughts were. And, and that's why I said, I think there is a happy medium where you can, you can, you can ask for advice. You don't have to keep everything so close. Um, but the other, t- the other part is, you know, you have to protect your idea and, and it's not going to be healthy to share everything either. Yeah. It's funny when you're starting out, it's like you're, you have to like beg for attention. You have to like beg, borrow and steal just to get on blogs and things. But like at the very beginning, when you're not even ready, everyone's like trying to keep everything tight and not tell anyone. It's funny. It's, it's kind of ironic. It is. It really is. Cause you really need that marketing and you need that PR when you need it. Yeah. But, but not too soon. Like, oh, not too soon. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. So in that sense of, I want to transition to like making the product. So this, this fascinates me, the process, especially the process people go through who haven't done this before. So in your sense, how much, uh, like how often did you bake? Like were you, or you're serving it raw really. So it's not really a cookie dough that you're cooking, but how much experience did you have before you started making it? And kind of what was the process to build that first batch or the first prototype? We had no experience whatsoever. Um, but we had to learn really fast because if we knew if we wanted to start creating, we had to create mass batch recipes. So that's something you don't think of. Like when you go into your kitchen and you make the Nestle Toll House recipe, it yields like, I don't know, 12 cookies or whatever. But we're talking about that we need to make 50 or a hundred servings. At the time we were making a lot smaller batches. Now we're making like hundreds and hundreds at a time. 
So when we started, we had to figure out how to rent a commercial kitchen, which is not easy. There's, there are new businesses and new technologies that are launching kitchens in cities across the US, but it's not a widely known thing. So we had to find a kitchen. We had to get licensed. We had to talk to the Department of Agriculture. Like, and, and I say that because it's starting the business is like, great, now I have my idea. Like now I need to build my foundation. And my foundation is not the fun stuff, like the marketing and the product creation. It's like, how do I start building the house around the idea? And that's what we did all summer is, is, you know, putting some, some sugar and butter in a bowl and like testing out the different um, measurements and whatever. It was difficult, but it was not the hardest thing we had to do. You know, we, we had, we were taste testers along the way, so we made it fun. Um, but it was a lot more of that of like learning how to use a kitchen and, and how to use a shared space and, and then, you know, coming up with fun recipes. So we had, I, we were really fortunate. We had a lot of people who helped us along the way, but for the most part, we had to figure out how to do all that. So I, this is probably a bad host. I, we should have talked about like what the product, can you, can you just describe oh, sure. for everyone, like what at the, at the early stages, what that product looked like? And then now kind of what are your product options you have now? So the cookie dough company sells eight different kinds of edible cookie dough, ice cream sundaes. Um, we started as a mobile food truck. So, and, and uh, there's a reason why that's important, but we started as a food truck and now we've evolved into a pop-up restaurant and we will have our own brick and mortar soon. So the reason why I mentioned we started as a food truck is because you have limited space. So that created limitations in itself. So our, our product at first, it's funny because from a tasting perspective, It was like way too sugary, way too dense. Just like, I mean, I knew it was then, but I was like still, you know, evolving it while we're starting our business. When we started, we had four different flavors and now we have this whole line of different dessert concoctions that we've created, which is pretty cool. In terms of like consumer research. So it's interesting. People have different methods. In your case, was it you went to parties and you got kind of qualitative feedback. You give some here, they're like, oh, it's really good or oh, it's a little salty. Or mm-hmm. was there like quantitative? Did you send a survey out where you like, I know Steve's very analytical. Was there any sort of like measuring with the feedback and using that to kind of guide the product iteration? No. And it's funny to hear you say that because sometimes I think that people make things more complex than they need to be. Yeah. And that may have been where we saw that it was too complex for us. It was it was more straightforward. It was, we're making a good quality product that we enjoy eating that we've shared with friends. And we know that it's, it's becoming something that they enjoy. And I think it was just, we never thought about that. We just always thought we would be successful right? and that it would be something that people would want. So maybe that was, you know, just the bright eyed, you know, rose colored glasses viewpoint, but maybe that's kind of what pushed us forward and made us successful. Yeah. But I mean, it, it sounds like it's working. And, and yeah. to be honest, there's no, there's no right way to do it. I think and sometimes data, like analysis paralysis data can be crippling yeah. at times. So you could get it back and you not know what direction to go. So that that's yeah. interesting though. Another question is when you mentioned, so you're work, still working full time. What, what was your personal time split? Like in those early days, was it just doing kind of in the kitchen at night, trying to figure this out? on vacations? What was that? What what was that like? Yeah, we were working all the time and we still are working all the time. We've just figured out a better work-life balance. But if you take, if you go back to spring of 2018, I mean, we were, I'm, I'm in sales. Steve was a CPA. We're working eight to five every single day. We're in the kitchen from five 30 to usually like 1130 or 12 making stuff for events either the next day or that weekend or whatever it was. And then in between, you know, we're doing, we're reaching out to, um, they're like booking agents basically who host events and we're networking with other local businesses to find out where we can bring, do pop-ups or bring our food trucks. So yeah. And it, it is such a grind, especially with, with both full-time job and that on the side. Yeah. Did you, yeah. did you guys hit a wall ever? Was there ever like a, we should give up moment or you just kept one foot in front of the other and it really hasn't been. I mean, there's, we have moments all the time still then, I mean, then I think maybe we did more so because we really had no idea what we were doing. And sometimes there are, t- sometimes I will say like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? 
last weekend we did an event and, and Steve and I are still working the business as much as we can. But, um, and when I mean, I mean work, I mean like they're at the store serving customers and things like that. Um, and we worked an event on Saturday for the Girl Scouts and it was a sleepover at the mall. So they were there till, well, we were at the mall almost till three 30 in the morning. Wow. And at the end, we're driving home and we get home at 4 a.m. And it's like, what are we doing? Yeah, like, why are we doing this? We're killing ourselves. Counting you your know, pennies. You're like, oh, 220 <laughs> bucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then the next day, you know, we thought about it some more. And it's like, this is this is what we have to do to get to the next point, to get to the next level, to do the more of the things that we like to do. So, yeah. I, if you're not having like a tear your hair out moment or like a complete breakdown, then like, what are you doing? You yeah, know, something, you're, not giving... you're not going hard enough. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So when you talk about, so it's interesting, you mentioned the food truck and I, I want to spend some time talking about like early customer acquisition. So for you guys, you, you chose to go the food truck route early on, but yeah. once you got out of that friends and family circle, how did you start getting acquiring customers that were strangers or at least friends of friends and then strangers? What did that look like? I had two kind of like schools of thought because of when we launched our business. So number one, it really helps that we have a bright pink, you know, billboard that travels down the highway because that is a great way to get a customer. Somebody's like, what the hell just drove down the highway? Yeah, yeah. You know, and we would literally get emails as we were driving down the, down the street. And it'd be like, I just drove down 71 and I saw your truck. And like, what do you do? You know? Like, yeah, that's amazing. Wanted to know. Um, but we actually launched our business the end of the summer going into, going into fall, going into winter. But and this was 2018 we, or 2017? This was 2018. 2018. And when we really got going, it was the, it was the winter time. I mean, like when we were planning more events. And so there's not much to do in Cleveland in the winter time. I mean, nobody is outside. Obviously it's like a tundra. And we were thinking about what could we do that we can engage with people who would be like our perfect target market who might have kids, but still like to go out and go to the fun things that we like to do. Um, and we settled on beer. So we targeted breweries in the area and reached out to as many breweries as we could and said, Hey, we're this new business. Like we think a, a cookie dough and beer pairing would be really cool. You don't get as much customers in the winter in the winter time. You know, let's talk about an event and bring people together for this for this event. And so we did our first one, and we sold out in like an hour. Yeah, it's and it was and it was insane. It was like a hundred tickets. You know what I mean? To us, that was like, oh my god! Like I can't believe people are going to come to this. So we we leveraged that for for five months that, you know, Cleveland is a gray hole in the winter time. And we went to every brewery that would have us and we sold these events. And so it was very grassroots. And then when we really open up in the spring and the summer, we've already got a group of people who know about us and, and, you know, have been able to kind of like evangelize the coolness of cookie dough. Yeah. And talk about those, that, like the way you thought about those collaborations. Like, I think it's a brilliant idea. The, the brewery is brilliant, especially because in Cleveland, there's so many. But did yeah. you did you think of any other, like at that point, after that first one worked, were you like, wait, all the, we have all these other partners we could potentially go with? Or, or was it kind of like, yeah. let's focus on this, go to the breweries, do as many as we can, and then see where we're at? Yeah. So we, we were more intentional with the, with the events of key of kind of staying in our lane. And I, and I still think about this today is the more that you, I love collaborations and I have a, a, so many plans to collaborate with other local businesses and even other larger brands. Um, but I think that the more that you try to fit your product, like a circle product into a, you know, square peg or whatever that is, that you're going to dilute your brand because it's not going to make sense anymore. So if we were to say we're, we're in the brewery and winery lane, but, um, tomorrow we're going to be in like this, I don't know, socks lane or something like that. And cookie dough and socks, like it's just not going it, to, it's not going to work. So we stayed in that lane for a while and we still are. And I think I'm, I'm continuing to evolve of what I think those collaborations will look like in the future. And talk about, talk about how hard doing one of those is. So like if, if you were to go to a brewery, let's say it's, it's kind of a, a, a seamless pairing, which is good, like it already, yeah. but if you, you, you drive the truck, well, you guys pre-bake like 200 or again, you're not baking it, but mm-hmm. you'd pre-portion 200 or 300 or whatever, drive yeah. the truck. How did that work? 
Yeah. So, I mean, when we do set up events, we, we have it down pat now, like we know what to do. We know how to staff it. Um, you know, we, we have people on site, so we scoop everything on site, but I think the one thing that helped us and, and made this so smooth is that, um, I'm, a, I'm really big on, on building relationships and networking and having relationships with the owners of breweries and wineries and anyone who would have us was super important because at the time, like I wasn't selling this well-oiled event that now we, I could run in my sleep. Right. I was selling this. We don't know how it's going to, how if anyone's going to buy this. We don't know if anyone's going to show up. We don't know how we're going to staff it. <laughs> like our bartender is going to be okay with it. And now, um, and, and so anyway, that I was selling, you know, kind of this idea and building the relationships with those people. So I guess for anyone who would be listening, who is saying like, yeah, I want to add this to my business or I want to collaborate with other businesses. I would say just start building those relationships as early as you can. And then once you do enough of any kind of event or experience, you know, you'll get better along the way. Yeah, absolutely. The next kind of section is like product iteration. You talked a little bit already about where the product started and where it went. And we, we talked about kind of market sensing a little bit. And you said like, that's something that's on your radar more now than was before. With the way people are trending towards like healthy, healthy snacking, how does your product fit in the landscape and how do you message that to people? Well, you know, I, it doesn't, it doesn't fit in a health trend, but I don't, but I think that on the opposite side of what the trends are, I think that the biggest trend that is going to affect any brand that's going to affect our brand from small companies to, to large corporations is a, is a cultural experience within your company. So yeah, I I think health food is always going to be out there. I think anytime you put a diet in front of it, or if you put a, you know, now we have gluten-free vegan, whatever you want to say, that is going to attract someone. I mean, I'm even, I even, you know, prefer some of those things too, but where I think that we're going and the trend that the lane that I want to stay in is I want to provide an experience to my guests, something that makes them feel like while they are indulging that it's worth it because of the way that it makes them feel as they're, they're able to consume and, and be a customer. I love that. So it's not just, okay, I'm getting a ice cream cone or I'm getting a cup of cookie dough and I'm going to go about my day. It's, okay, now I'm going to snap a photo. Now I'm going to, I'm going to really like emerge myself in all of these like bright colors. And, and, and that's kind of more so with our shop that we're opening up. But, um, that's my goal is to, is to create that experience for every customer that walks through the door. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. So another, I'm sure you guys have started thinking about like almost like stacking trends. Like another trend is this, this concept where people will go to restaurants or eateries just for the Instagram photo. Like there's a cool yeah. like Ivy wall or whatever. And the food is what it is, but the, mm-hmm. the experience in the photo is amazing. Have you thought about, okay, if we can build, like you mentioned, if we can build this experience, we're going to have amazing product, but also the experience where people can either come take a photo or like, would you market it around something like that? Oh, a, a hundred percent. Yeah. I, I think that the the kind of class that we're in, if we're millennials or whatever you want to call us. But I mean, we grew up with technology and and that's why the bar is set so high of what we're looking for because we're having these shared experiences. So having that to integrate into our overall design concept and making sure people are acutely aware of that when they know what they're getting when they come into any of our stores is something that's really important to me. Got it. I want to, so I want to talk about the product roadmap a little bit. How are you thinking about like 12, 24 months? Are there going to be new types of products you're offering? Or are you going to double down in what you're currently doing? Like, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, well, well, here's the thing that's interesting. And, and, um, this kind of changes the future of the cookie dough business. But so what we've done is, is I really love the idea of, Cleveland cookie dough remaining on a food truck. And I like it because it is that sweet treat indulgent item that you're going to have. And you're not going to come in every single day, but maybe every time you see us at a festival or you see us at a lunch event, it's like, I'm going there. I know that I don't get this every day. So I'm going to get it. And I love that. Um, kind of, I guess it's limited or, or, you know, like a limited edition kind of thing. Right. Um, and so with that, we're opening up a brick and mortar store, but it's actually going to be an ice cream centric 
concept. Okay. I'm very interested so in talking have about this. A, it'll have a little bit of cookie dough, but, but to your point of identifying trends early is there's a trend that I have been monitoring for almost two years, almost as long as cookie dough was created. Um, there's stores in New York, there's stores in LA and Miami that have this ice cream concept. And again, there's nothing like it in Cleveland. And I thought, well, I'm going to do this. I mean, I love this idea. And ice cream to me is so, um, it fits really well with the brick and mortar setup because you know where you're going. Like you, it's traditionally more so, um, I mean, ice cream is an American treat. People just understand it a lot, a lot better than cookie dough. We're opening that up in the spring, but that's where my the majority of my focus is going to be. And and so you mentioned a store like this doesn't exist. Is it a specific like application of ice cream? Is it the like the frozen on the block thing? Is it like that or something else? It, it's kind of like that. So um, I don't know when this is going to air, but I'll yeah, tell you this. Probably so, a few weeks. So you're, okay. Yeah, you're <laughs> so um, it's a machine that it. So the concept is an ice cream and cereal bar. Okay. So when customers come in. Um, they'll see a wall full of different cereals and chocolates and little mix-ins and stuff. And we're only serving vanilla ice cream. Okay. So we'll take scoops of vanilla ice cream. We'll put it in this machine. It mixes cereals, candies, all sorts of stuff together. And then it comes out like soft serve on the bottom. So the company is called Remix. And the idea is, is kind of like a play on words and you can remix your own dessert. And then we'll also have some funky like musical elements and speakers and all sorts of stuff in the store. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a McFlurry, but custom, whatever you want, yes, however much you exactly. want. Yeah, exactly. So is the goal to, you're going to own dessert in Cleveland? Is that like, like if you were to fast forward 10 to 20 years, do you want to own dessert yeah. in Cleveland? Do you want to own dessert like new application? Like how are you thinking about the brand evolving? I mean, you know, again, if you were to, if, if, if you were to ask, like, just say the first thing that comes to your mind, the first thing would be that I would want there to be a remix in every single city starting in the Midwest yeah. and then working our way out. That would, that would be like where I see the most value and where I think that we would have the most fun in growing the business. Um, but I'll tell you that going through this process for the first time is it's excruciating. It's, it's, it's really a scary thing. We've never been through it before. So that's why we're, we're starting, we're dipping our toe and then we'll see what happens. So talk, I want to dive into this a lot. So talk about okay. what's different about starting, like building the brick and mortar remix focused and kind of the process you went through the cookie dough piece early on. What's what, talk about all the differences. The biggest the biggest is the level of investment, to yeah. be honest with you. I mean, you know, we cashed in the money we got for our wedding and some of our savings to buy that box truck and mm-hmm. just kind of went for it. Um, and then when we're talking about opening up a brick and mortar store, we're talking about outside financing. We're talking about, we're building a brand, a brand new brand. I mean, this has to be something that now we're having to, to educate the market on something else that we're doing. Um, And the biggest difference, if you really think about it, is we didn't need to have a huge marketing strategy because when we showed up, customers were there, sometimes even waiting for us to show up. Now we're having to look and say, what are we going to do as a company to bring people to us? Like, what are, what are they going to find so special about our company and our product that they want to keep coming back? Is, is the Cleveland cookie dough company, is that going to be the umbrella over everything or are you launching a separate brand? You're going to run them both. How are you thinking about that fitting in the portfolio? So they're going to, they're going to run completely independently. Okay. They will have some crossover because the physical space will serve as a production facility for Perfect. the food truck. That's a smart idea. So we're, yeah. So, and we, and the reason why too, is we have rent for the food truck because you need a commissary kitchen. So we're just going to transfer that over to the building and, and, you know, make it a profit center instead of just an expense. Do you have the branding yet for the, the remix type ice cream shop? Um, we, yeah, we have some of our branding in place. I'm, I'm talking to different artists and people that can help make it really cool. Are you like franchising from the, or is it just like the remix technology is what these other stores had in LA, New York, and Miami? Yeah. So everyone has the, this, certain type of equipment. I won't say what the equipment is called, but they have this, this machine. And, um, that's what we're using basically to build our whole company around our, our buying these machines. That's amazing. So how are you, how are you diversifying resources for between that and 
and the cookie dough, how are you diversifying human capital resources? Like who's going to focus mm-hmm. on what? Because this is a challenge that I'm sure most entrepreneurs like who are building separate brands or scaling have to face, but you're yeah. facing it very early. So how, how are you thinking about this? If you have any listeners who can help me with this, I would love some advice because- Mom, you got um, any ideas? Yeah. <laughs> Because it's, it's, there's so many moving parts. And I, you know, what I I've kind of learned from this whole experience is you can only prepare so much and you only have so much time in a day to think about certain things. So I can't give so much thought to, okay, like what are, what are we going to do when we build a team and then who's going to do the trainings and what's the day to day? Because today my biggest thing is, okay, well, how am I going to pay the contractor and what are the decisions I have to make for the build out? Right. So it would be so nice. And if you have, and, and as, as I see it, I work in the corporate world, you have a department dedicated to every single one of those decisions. It doesn't have to be one person making them. And unfortunately we're stuck in, we are those people, you know, we're the janitor and we're the marketing geniuses. Like we have to be everything. Yeah. So, um, we don't know how all of it is going to work yet, but it's, it's going to come together as we progress. You know, like I listen to how I built this a lot and it's easy oh, to, uh, yeah, it's guy Ross is amazing at, at hosting I that. I aspire to be like that one day, but, uh, it's, it, it, it's amazing for those people who have succeeded to look back and just, and that's another reason why I made this podcast. They gloss over yeah. all of the frustration. Like you are in the thick of it right now. Yeah. You're, you're, you're kind of worried and, and focused on how do I solve today? How do I solve tomorrow? How do I solve next week? You're not as concerned with what's the 12 to 24 month strategy, which is, which is really interesting. I'm, I'm curious, can you talk about, and, and you mentioned a little bit in pieces, but what did you see from the cookie dough side that you were like, we have to switch this? Was it opportunistic that you, you kept going, you kept seeing these remix machines in these popular cities. You're like, yeah. wait, this is even at more ahead of the curve than the cookie dough was, or were you, was the cookie dough business not scaling as fast and as easy as you thought? And you were like, we got to diversify. No, you know, that's a good question. And, and I think that, I think cookie dough is, is excellent. I think we had so much growth this past year that we weren't even expecting it. Like when we were doing our financials along the way, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we were doing so much better than I thought, but it goes back to your point earlier of when you look at trends, like what is their, what's the life cycle that they have? And, you know, I think cookie dough is really fun right now. Do I think that it'll be a dessert in 20 years? I don't know. I mean, my gut tells me no. And, but my gut is also telling me that if I, if we want to diversify the things that we do and my, me personally, if I want to stay interested and I want to stay challenged, then I needed to add something else to to my, to to my portfolio, to my mix. Yeah. And so I think remix was something that I've been thinking about for a while. And when Steve and I were talking about what we were going to do for the brick and mortar, we thought at first we could do them together. And we thought, no, like this is a really special idea. It's really cool. It deserves its own lane and own focus. And like I said, I think cookie dough is better suited on the, on a truck because of how people consume it and how they understand it. And, and I mean, who knows? I could be all wrong, but I mean, this gut reaction, that's, that's how I feel about it. So is, is your plan now don't put any more capital investment into the, the cookie, like don't buy more trucks or anything for the cookie dough side for now. Like let's keep, keep it running. I'm sure you have employees that are running that and that's kind of generating good income yeah. as it is. And then you're going to focus all the capital and we have a section on funding in a second, but yeah, I'm interested in that. I, I, I wouldn't say we're not focusing on that or investing in additional resources because we, we very much are yeah. like, we're continuing to buy equipment. Um, where we do a lot of catering. And so the, what, what I want to explore is buying additional equipment and setups so we can make it more interactive and make it more experiential for our clients. For sure. So I would say that that's still something that we're investing in, but maybe the idea to me is more that it'll stay as a mobile business than more so of giving it its own brick and mortar location. Yeah. But, but I think honestly, with any business owners, there has to be some level investment, whether it is in human capital and the people that you have and making sure that they feel loyal and invested or it's equipment, something, you know, that's, that's more tangible, but, you know, as a business owner, those are the things that are important to me that we're not just putting something by the wayside, but continuing to make sure that it's as up to par as we want it to be. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a great strategy because 
you're able to get the bang for the buck in the production side for the cookie dough in the in the facility. And at some point, if you want to do a cross collaboration, like just set up a shelving in remix with some cookie dough on the side, like not a 50-50, you can, or you could make the Cleveland cookie dough version where one of the toppings is the cookie dough, right? And, the, and yep. you're whipping those around. So that's really interesting. Um, I want to talk about so given that the remix is still early on, I'm, I'm super fascinated about like how you're thinking about that, but also on the cookie dough side, I want to talk about like tactically the way you've marketed. So like you uh -huh. with the graphic design background, I'm sure you're kind of front and center with what is the marketing strategy? What are like the tactical Instagram ads or Facebook ads? A lot of these podcasts don't go into the depths of what do you actually do or how do you actually measure the ROI? Like, can you talk about yeah. that a little bit? How do you think about that? Yeah. Well, you know, that's another thing. And that goes back to, you can't be great at everything in your business, but you should know enough to be dangerous about a lot, you know? And so, um, I'm not, I, I didn't study marketing. I will say that I don't fully even understand marketing statistics and how to use them, but I know enough to be dangerous. Right. And I, I think that's what everyone needs to hear is you don't need like a fancy ass Instagram grid to grow a usership. And you don't need to like have a color scheme in your grid to make sure people are engaging with you. You just have to be really consistent with what you put out and you have to create a real brand. So like, like for example, you know, I was talking about Coca-Cola earlier, like you're not going to see people on the production lines and like waving and saying, hi, but as a small business owner, um, people want to see you. They want to see, um, your, they want to hear your story. They want to, they want to feel like they're close to you. And like anyone can do this because honestly, anyone can, it just yeah. takes a lot of work. And so that's part of the marketing strategy is be real, be yourself. And that's what we, we try to do is, um, you know, make it as visually appealing as we can, but also show ourselves throughout our different social media channels. I have a friend who I just met with who was like, you know, and she studied marketing and she's like, you have got to spend money to make money. Like if you're not paying at least $50 a week in Instagram and Facebook ads as a small business owner, like you're missing out. And even $50, like, what is that? That's nothing, right. you know? So you should be able to equate that to something that's either going to help you build your user base, or it's going to help you convert those into customers, which is, should be the same. Right. Um, yeah. And we, you know, the last thing related to marketing that I think we have done really well is we've seen a huge return on, um, on different freebies and giveaways that we have. So we're, we haven't done this probably since late of last year, but we used to do a lot of giveaways. Um, we gave away an entire truck event to somebody for them and 30 of their friends. And that's just stuff that I would like, you know, if I, if I'm a consumer and somebody's raffling off my favorite item or a food truck to come to my house and like serve all my friends, that's really freaking cool. So I would say never underestimate the power of giving away something fun because people are going to gravitate to that. Yeah. That's the thing is you just got to simple it down. Like you just mm. simple it way down. Like what, what is the thing that I would want? Or what is the yeah. thing that my like siblings or younger family members are telling me I want? And then it's really interesting you say that about the Instagram ads because I think social marketing, digital marketing is all about experimentation, right? If you're, yeah. you throw 50 bucks, you can easily test the concept. And if it works, it's so easy to just pour more money on that exact same idea and just watch the, the return come in. Yeah. And my friend had told me, she's like, I will run one for a day. And if at the end of the day, I notice that it got a really good return rate, she's like, I'll put even more money into it. Yeah, And see what happens. And it depends what the content is. You know, I mean, you want to make sure that it's, it's not just like, Oh, look what we did today, but it's a sales driven message. Like, look what we did. Contact me for this or that or whatever. Um, and even in, we're in the food business, but catering is where we make a lot of our money. So we have to like continuously engage people who are in positions where they could book us for anything from a birthday to a, you know, employee appreciation day. And the, is the way you structure those, like you just keep a tally of how many people come up and then you charge them a certain rate or do you charge them by hour and you, you already have the margin built in? Like, how do you, how do you think about that? 
Um, here's a hard thing. To, and I don't care what anybody says that you can read as many manuals and books on how to price your product as much as you can. But when you're in it and you're running it, um, there's no easy answer to know how to price your product and know what you should be making. So, um, and the reason why I say that is because I think people get really scared. And I was really scared in the beginning too, of how we price and are we, are we too cheap? Are we too expensive? Um, but that's another experimentation. You won't know until you're in it. Yeah. Um, but you got to cover your costs and your labor. I mean, there's, you know, there's there's definitely, and yeah, like there's still things you need to consider, but, um, don't be afraid of that. So we, when we do catering, we either charge per person upfront based on the number of attendees, or we could do like a pay per transaction, just like you mentioned, depending on who comes up. Um, it depends on the event and like all, not everyone's created equal. For sure. I want to talk about competition a little bit. So mm-hmm. obviously when you're first starting out, usually, or at least the way I think is you see these kind of big giants in the space and you want yeah. to be like them. You want to learn from them. And then at some point the switch flips and you say, okay, like that's, that's my competition. That's my enemy. Like I want to go after, I want to take market share from them. How, how do you think about that? And, and where are you? like in this stage of the business, where are you in that thinking? And and who would you say are the kind of big competitors that you're, you're looking at? I mean, you know, the, okay. So the funny thing is I mentioned that within three weeks of us launching our business, we had a direct competitor, like a company that does mobile cookie dough options. I mean, we're talking about like very, very, very close. It was crazy. It really was. And it was, I think I spent like an, an entire weekend just being sick to my stomach about it. Like I, we spent all summer creating this project, building our brand, starting a company, like learning it. And, and now like they're going to come in and they're going to win and they're going to take all of our business. And the funny thing is, is you have just got to keep going. I mean, I think you have to know your competition. Um, and we've gotten good at knowing who that is. Um, but, but you have to assume that in, especially in food, I mean, everyone is your competition, right? Like some in the, in a food truck, you know, we're there, there's an ice cream cart along the way. There's, you know, fried dough, donuts, whatever we are competing with those people. But a way that I've always looked at competition is that there is, there's enough for everyone. As long as you're doing your job, like we could have cried in a corner and been like, we're going to lose. And we would have, but as long as we keep going, we keep booking events, we keep, you know, uh, keep up with marketing. We keep engaging with our customers. Like we're always going to win. So uh, I guess I would say to anybody who is like thinking about the whole landscape is consider everyone a competitor. Consider that you have to keep doing a really, really good job to stay ahead of the curve. But I mean, they're not going to go away and you just have to, you know, recognize that and do the best you can. So do you, do you look at like the, the Mally's which is for people who aren't from Ohio, that's like a huge like chocolate empire company in Ohio. Do you look at, and like Mitchell's in Cleveland is like amazing ice cream. And now you're kind of going to the ice cream space with Remix. Do you go in there and like try to take little things like not steal, but like get inspired by the way, like, oh, the, I, I like the way they're like pumping scent in here or like how the, the checkout flow works or like where they put the tip jar, like things. Do you, do you find yourself yeah. like going into those places and just absorbing all that? Yeah. I mean, so for like locally, yes. And we did some, we were in a local pitch competition. And so we did a lot of research for that. And they, they kind of said that same thing of you better go into these stores and start counting customers and seeing where things are set up. But, you know, before we invested as much as we did in Remix, we started visiting ice cream stores all across the country to see how they were run and what worked for them and, and noticed, you know, some of them were, were different than others and just by, you know, by a hair or some of the different things that they had set up. So, um, yeah, I think that there's no one idea that's ever original. So borrow some of the things that people are doing, but you'll always put your own spin on it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like nothing that we create will ever be quite like what someone else creates because it's just, it's, it's our take on it. You know, that's really interesting. Like thinking about the, the competitive, like ripple, like you could, you could think at the beginning, you could think your competitors are like mobile cookie dough delivery. Then like a little wider is like cookie dough. Then a little wider is like any type of cookie. Then it's like any type of dessert. Then it's like any type of indulgence. And then it's anything you put in your mouth, right? Like you're always, 
that's why the food space is so difficult because there's only so many calories people eat per day. So that's, that's really interesting. You know, you look at how many, um, technologies are similar. Like I, like, for example, there's somebody that I just, I was just listening to at this pitch incubator, this, um, like small business incubator in Cleveland. Yeah. And there's like a ride share app, like similar to Uber and Lyft, but it's for Cleveland and it's like for a specific group of people. And so I'm listening to that and I'm like, God, like I would this guy build an app that goes against these like huge giants. But then I thought, you know, he's targeting a specific niche and this is what he's going after. And like, you know, everybody's got to find their, their value that they can bring. So again, there's, there's competitors in every, everything that you Yeah. Do. I mean, if there's no competitors, then it's probably not a space worth being. And to be honest, like, if you think about it, everyone's got to eat, everyone's got to eat three to six times a day. And sure. They don't always eat indulgent foods for every meal, but a lot of times people are pairing healthy options with like that indulgent option at the end. So if, as, as long as you can be a premium product in that space, I mean, you're, there's unlimited mouths to feed. So yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I want to shift and this kind of section around like funding and equity, you can talk as much or as little as you want, but I, I find again on, on these kind of mega podcasts, they, they gloss over this quickly and they only really focus on funding if it's like outside VC or PE money and, and everything is kind of hushed. So I'm curious, let's start with like early on with the cookie dough side, how did you think about funding it? Did you earmark a, a chunk of money and say, okay, let's, let's experiment with this money and see what happens. And then how did that, you know, how, how did you think about that? Yeah. So a, a lot of things in my twenties prepared me to make an investment in something that I wanted to do. And I say that because had I have not kind of had all my ducks in a row, we maybe wouldn't have been able to just as easily invest as we did in the food truck. Um, but I think if we did the food truck or anything else that we were going to do at the time, because we were, you know, kind of spitballing ideas and building a company, um, it would have been something that we self-funded. And that's what happens when you say that something's a hobby or a nights and weekends business is like, you cannot afford to leverage your entire life savings on that. So we knew that we were going to use the money that we had in our savings. And still it was a big risk, but I said this before, we, I never had this thought that we wouldn't be successful. I really didn't. I just, I knew we would pay it back. I knew we would make money. And if we, if the worst happened, like, whatever. We'd have a good story to tell. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we used our own money to start, um, to start Cleveland cookie dough. And something that we, that we did that actually helped us a lot is we took out an interest-free credit card. And so I think we had like a $20,000 limit and we put everything else on there that we needed, like marketing t-shirts. Um, you know, we put our, the wrapping that you have to put on the truck. We put all of that on a credit card. And we maxed it out, but we knew that we were going to have it paid off within that year. So that was, that was a really good tool for Sounds us. Sounds like an interest-free loan, really. Like ex That's exactly what it was. Yeah. So that was really awesome the way it worked out. And I think we paid it back in like month nine or something, which was awesome. So um, we did that. Remix is not that. Remix is a very expensive project. And we didn't realize how expensive it would be when we were first in it. So um, what we thought we could self-fund and then get a small loan from the Cleveland Department of Economic Development turned into, okay, now we have to look at outside capital and what are we going to do? So um, my, the like anecdote that I think, and I've told a bunch of people this story is like when I graduated college, no one asked me, or when I started college, no one asked me like, what's your degree? Like, do you think you'll be profitable? Like how long do you think it'll take you to be profitable? When are you going to pay this back? Not one creditor like gave, asked me that question, but they gave me $20,000 every year. Yeah. So I find that to be so odd because when we started looking for financing, we went to big banks and they turned us down. And, and for us, we have, we have fantastic credit, um, on paper, we look really, really good and we are getting denied. And it's for a number of reasons. Like, you know, we're not in business three years or um, X, Y, and Z. Like there's a whole bunch of kind of things that, right. that came up from it. But it was, it, it was kind of crazy to me that these things were happening. And it, it kind of led me to believe that 
if we who are in the high percentage of people who are in their 30s and like make a lot of money and have money in the bank are getting denied, think about somebody who has a really good idea who maybe isn't from our same socioeconomic background. Like they're going to have an extremely Yeah, it's impossible for them to raise money. It's impossible. Yeah. Um, and the same thing, like a lot of articles that I read are like, oh, well, you can have a friends and family round. Like, what do you know that has like $50,000 lying around? Yeah, you have to get lucky with an uncle of a, of a friend that like, you know, and that rarely happens. Yeah. So what did you guys end up doing? Did, did you take, did you sell equity? Uh, no, no, no. Okay. So, so that's definitely like not something that table. we're willing to do. Um, I would, I've talked to enough business owners to know that do not give away any equity, especially as you're, you're so small, wait until you really want to, and until you want to grow so much that that's the only option. Right. And that's kind of how I look at it. Um, but we were able to take advantage of a lot of programs given to us by the city. So economic development departments are incredible. Cleveland worked with us. Um, uh, they worked with us on it. The neighborhood economic development team worked with us on it. We've met with a lot of different small uh, loan organizations that are typically nonprofits that have money from either the SBA or from the city that they have to use and invest in certain projects. Right, which is great. It's incredible. How much did having the track record, at least with the first two years of the cookie dough business, help with that versus if if someone just came off the street with the yeah. remix idea with no experience, is it harder for them or are those loans still up for grabs? Yeah. So it's, I think that it's, it would be possible, but my advice would be know your numbers back, forth, sideways, up and down. Yeah. I am not a numbers person. And I would always recommend to anybody have a, either a partner that is good with finance or bring in somebody or have a really good CPA. Because I think if Steve and I didn't have as detailed financial projections that had built in seasonality and, um, you know, customer acquisition and all of these different things that it would have been really difficult for us to convey what our future expectations are and how we would pay back this money. Um, so I think that it's possible. Anything's possible, but I would tell anybody you have to know your numbers. So with the truck, did you, you, did you buy that outright in cash or did you, okay. So that was, that was awesome that you didn't have any debt from that. And then, so now this yeah. is the first kind of like debt financing you're taking on. Yeah. We've never had any debt until now. And it's, it's really, it's, it's a really scary thing. I mean, even today we went and signed our papers and the money is ours and that's great. It, it feels really yeah, good when you get yeah, that infusion cleared. of cash. Yeah. <laughs> um, it feels really scary when you have to pay, you know, more than your mortgage payment for these loans. And, and that's, kind of what we're going to be going through. I'm curious into so like the the truck, how fast did the truck pay yeah. itself back and then how how are you project how fast are you projecting being able to like pay the loan back or is it more you know you're going to have to fund with debt for a while and this is more just yeah. like let's grow the brand, brand as fast as possible. So with Cookie Dough, we it's funny because we paid off our debt within that nine month period that we owed for our interest free credit card. Um, but we invested what we made from Cleveland cookie dough into remix for sure, which is great. I want to shift to like hiring and, and human capital and, and yeah. all the employees you guys have, because I think that's so understated and undervalued. I, I personally oh, think yeah. the most important thing you can do as a founder is get just baller people and people who are passionate about your vision, who you inspire, yeah. who are like, really good at whatever competency they're working on. So can you talk about like, what are you going to look for in, I mean, you may have to hire like a, you know, manager across the whole Remax store, right? Cause yeah. you're going to take off the apron and, and, you know, focus on more of like the managerial tasks. Someone's going to have to run that day to day. So what are you going to look for? What type of skills, what type of uh, attributes? I think someone that can kind of be a chameleon in many different ways. I think someone that can communicate with many different um, people and behaviors and how they, you know, react in, in leading a team. I think that's really important. Um, and I think somebody that is is willing to invest their time with us as we're a growing business. And I say that because we don't have a infrastructure, like when you go to work at a McDonald's, McDonald's is very, um, you know, they, this is what you do. This is the system in place. These are the rules. If you break the rules, this is what happens. 
we're kind of in the ground floor of we can create all of those, but we need someone there who invests in that idea and who will help us create those things. So absolutely someone who's self-motivated, a self-starter, someone who wants to take ownership of what their, you know, duties and, 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 um, you know, tasks are as being that manager. So that's what we'll look for, but that evolves every day right, as right. we change and as, you know, the, the job title really changes. Something I heard the other day was, uh, when, when people hire specifically for like the attributes on our, like you, you write the job description and yeah. anyone who hires specifically for that, like it's, it's kind of tough because they just made up that job description. Like, you know, like that yeah. usually you're just hiring, you want to hire someone who's like self-motivated, who's just off the page, like just a smart person, overall yeah. hard worker, right? But it's tough to match like criteria. Oh, I know. Or like when you read a job description, it's like, um, must be trustworthy, like must be dependable. It's like, duh. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, like that, of course, that's what I need. Like, I'm not hiring for that. That's like, that's, you know, the offset of just being a good leader, or like go- being a good team member. Yeah. So when you think about Companies, especially in this space, when they start really growing, which to be honest, I think with the Remix concept, you very well could have four to 10 stores in five years if it, yeah. if it takes off. How do you think about bringing on like more strategic hires, right? Like someone who's going to run all the marketing or someone who's going to yeah. run like partnerships for you. Like how big do you need to get for that to start coming into play? You know, I think it just comes down to the the analyzing your numbers and knowing when you can afford to bring somebody on and, and us being smart enough to do that at the right time. Because when we look at what our projected growth is for this year, next year, the year after, and, you know, so on and so forth, it's saying, well, you know, the business can only take on, take in so much money that's just sitting there. I mean, we have to use it for ways that we can expand and grow. Right. So I think that it's, if we had enough money right now, we would have already had a social media person. We would have had, um, you know, a territory manager to, to go into basically we'll have three running locations, you know? Um, but we, but we don't. So I think it's just a matter of reevaluating the numbers after, you know, every year, twice a year and seeing when we could afford to bring those people on. And that's, that's probably one of the main reasons why people bring on VC or PE money is they take that money and then they either invest in more brick and mortar or they just pour, you know, you, you double up from like 10 to 20 people or five to 10 people. How do you think about, so I know equity is super precious and I think there's been more education recently around a lot of founders that got burned, gave it away too soon, but building an employee pool at a certain time where like you create like vested employees that are have that variable incentive. How do you think about that? I, I know you're probably still too like young in the, in the growth to have that, but like, how are you thinking about that? You know, I, on a very basic level and without even understanding or knowing what would be all possible to build employee incentive programs, I think that I want to build a team that feels like what they're doing matters and that they can see it in their wallet. And so, you know, we've talked a lot about, and this is aside from like building future like strategic plans and things. But we talked a lot about how can we incentivize people to want to come to work every day, to want to just do better than the status quo. It's, it is making sure that they are paid properly, that I think we pay a really fair rate. Um, But how we can build that in the future, I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know how we scale that as we continue to grow as a company, because we're in a weird place where everything feels very... um, we're in a fruit, we're in a frugal state right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everything's we tight. hope that, at, yeah, everything is, but we hope that as we're able to like really prove our concept and make money, that that's something that we will invest in as a company. Yeah. I think that that variable piece is so critical that like so many big companies just don't have because they're too big behemoths that they haven't thought about it. But think about it. Like you're in sales, you make commission, you're, you're going to grind harder with that direct variable payback. So I think that's exactly, that's critical. So I want to go into kind of like mentorship uh, slash like advisory. And I know you guys were part of the Jumpstart program, which is an amazing, one of the premier, if not the premier, like startup incubator type programs in Cleveland. Can you talk a little bit about that? How critical that was for your mindset, for the growth of the company and like what type of things you learned? The knowledge was endless, that there were so many things that we could take and use in our own business. So I'll just kind of give you the the elevator spiel of the program, but it's a, it's a 12 week long course where you spend two hours in class, you have homework, and then you come back the next week and you go over 
different strategies. And it could be anything of like marketing. It could, we did like a talent strategy one. Um, we did understanding your sales pitch. And then it all culminated at the end of the 12 weeks to this live 20 minute pitch competition where um, we basically shared what our, our you know financial projections were, introduced our company to a panel of judges. And then after that 20 minutes, then they deliberated and decided you know who ultimately won this competition. But the cool thing about it is they actually paid us to do it. Wow. So just through going through the program, it was like a mini MBA and we got $3,500 for participating, which was incredible. And that, uh, is that coming from like state funding or something like, cause that's crazy. That's like the opposite yeah. of what the model usually is. They like take equity from you. Yeah, no. So they have um, a really wide array of donors. They are a nonprofit okay. at, at their core. Um, but then they do have donors, like really large organizations, like the Metro and Key Bank are some of their biggest contributors. And that's where they get their funding. Nice. And the people, so d- did you have any specific like mentors either from that program or before or after that, you know, direct one-to-one either invested deep in you because they had functional expertise in the food space or just like a yeah. connection? Who who are those people and, and what did they offer? Yeah. So we had two specific mentors throughout the entire program and they were the ones who met with us. Um, we met with them separately outside of our two hour allotment and they were really challenged us to one, create our financials. Cause believe it or not, we had been in business almost a year and a half and we'd never ever built anything, any kind of projection. And so that was a big part of what the classes taught us. And it ta- also taught accountability. I mean, we as business owners had, we, you can't talk to your friends and you can't talk to your family. And I think that it's a really isolating place to be that you have to create business mentors or else you're going to be really frustrated and lost. And that's how I felt is nobody understands our business. And, you know, you can't really go to your friends and say, oh, you know, I want to invest in a $10,000 piece of equipment. And I'm talking about a hundred thousand dollars, this and that it's, it it doesn't, it's not the right, it's not the right scale. Yeah. They just, you're not getting that feedback that you need. So having them was really helpful and we continue to build those relationships. We have a meeting with another advisor on Thursday and we attend workshops that they have, but that's another thing that I would recommend to anyone who's starting is not only looking at economic development, but research any kind of business accelerators in your area, anywhere from like a rural town to um, New York or to LA is going to have these types of companies that can help you grow, or at the very least, listen to your idea and say, okay, make your roadmap. Here's, you know, here's what you need to do. And, and to that point, something that when we were doing Talio and and a lot of companies that I've explored have done is kind of built an advisory board, which mm-hmm. can or cannot have like advisory shares. Like I would, I'm sure it's best not to give them equity in your best interest, yes. but having like a go-to, almost like a board of directors before you need one, do you have that? And and who is on it if you, if you've thought about it? We don't have, a, we don't have a formal board. There are people that we go to if we have questions. We, I mean, right now, because Steve and I are the co-owners, I mean, we, I'm, I have 51%, he's a 49% owner that every, all of the ideas are really coming off of us, but we'll use our resources and our outside mentorship when we need it. I think that having a board of directors or even something that's a little bit more formal, it would be something that's part of you know, the future plans. But right now I think it's more important to keep the decision-making close because too many hands in the cookie jar. Yeah. It just, it doesn't work out well. So solicit advice when you need it, but also, you know, listen to your gut, talk with your partner, make sure it's a good fit. Is the, is the 5149, is that, was that just in order to break a stalemate from a decision? Like you need it to be staggered like that or it was more from a, a minority owned business or in, in this case, a, a female owned business. So um, we decided to go for the certification that we have that in, you know, in our operating agreement. That's really smart. Yeah. I want to shift to like struggles. And, and I know we, we have kind of chronologically gone through the process, but I want, I want to span the entire, all the way from the beginning till now. And, and to be fair with Remix, I'm sure you're experiencing, experiencing a lot more struggles than you were before. Yeah. But when you think back, what are the biggest struggles that you faced early on? And if you could go in a time machine back, what would you have done differently, if anything? I think there's a lot of struggles. I think every day is different. I I guess, you know, the pain is only as bad as you make it because some days feel really hard and then you wake up and you remember that 
you know, it's, it was just one bad day or it was one bad customer or one bad idea or whatever. And, and you kind of shake it off. I think one of the biggest struggles is understanding that there's a finite amount of time that you can spend on so many things. So, you know, you don't have, if, if you're having events all weekend long and your goal is to make money and grow your business, you can't go out and go to concerts with your friends or go party or, you know, do the things that I like to do. And I say liked because my fun meter has changed so much, you know, my, and I think that's always a struggle is like wanting to be a normal person and then realizing that what you're doing is it's just different. It's just a different lifestyle. And like, that's a choice. So I think the struggle in allocating time and being around your friends and family is hard. I think there's always a struggle in self-doubt that we talked about earlier is, am I going to fail? And if I do, like, am I risking the future of my life and my relationship and my marriage? And Steve and I talk about that a lot and try to balance it out with, you know, the fear of doing something and the fear of not doing something. And we do come back to that idea is like, this could be a really stupid idea. And we might spend, you know, the next five years paying back loans for a business we don't own, which we hope doesn't happen. But if we do, like, we're going to do it, we're going to do the best job that we possibly can and try our hardest to come out on top and make this a really fun experience in our life. And in in that vein, are there, is there anything you wish you knew that you know now that you wish you knew, right? So things that come to mind would be like the commercial kitchen piece. You wish you knew how to like make that happen quicker, like obviously faster cycle times, but anything come to mind that you wish you knew? Maybe what I have wished that I knew two years ago is that like, this is really fucking hard, (laughs) you know, like, like running a business, having a full-time job, being a friend, being a sister and a daughter and, and maintaining a life is really hard. And if I think if I knew it, then I don't think I would have started a business. But I also think that like, this is, this is the new normal. This is my life now. And I'm not going back, like to go fit into that box anymore. So one thing that could probably alleviate that pressure a bit is, is you not having to have a full-time job as well. Have have you thought about like the timing on that? Is it just going to be like business demands? Once the business is making enough money, you're, you're gone or. Yeah. Well, that's ever evolving too, because I've been it, I've been doing my same job for nine years. It's been great to me. Like I'm, I'm loyal to it. Um, I have an amazing boss. I really love my team. So it would be a really big thing to walk away from. And right now I have a nice balance and I think it comes down to, we'll have to, if I do stay in my job, we have to hire someone who's going to be able to take over my role and I just stay doing what I'm doing. But I think the, you know, the ultimate answer is yes. I, I, I will want to run my company or multiple companies full time. I just, um, there's a few more things that need to lock into place before that's even a realm of a possibility. When, when you think about like tactically, like what are your biggest questions right now? Like what are, what are your biggest challenges? Obviously the remix project is, is bringing on all sorts of things, but yeah. like if you were to make a list of like three things that are like at the top of your mind of like, all right, I got to figure this out at some point yeah. in the next few months, what does that look like? Ooh, okay. Biggest one, building a team. Okay. So how are we going to hire? What kind of um, incentive programs are we going to put in place for our employees? There's a lot that has to do with the physical space. So just like the curating of experiences. So um, right now I'm working with getting an installation artist to do some work at the shop. So it's putting all of those like elements together of design that I is a big focus. Yep. Um, And then one of the biggest things is that we are just about to go into our peak season for food trucks. So we're booking a ton of things now and it's without having a clear vision into what that looks like in May or June, it's having to trust that we're going to be okay and we're going to be staffed appropriately. So that's a big, that's a big question mark. It's like booking all of these events and then making sure that we are able to fulfill them is a big deal. I want to talk about scale and we talked about a little bit, but yeah, if you were to sit here with a uh, crystal ball and five, 10 years from now, like what is what is the ideal scenario? What do you want the brand, the portfolio of companies to look like? It's hard to say being at the or at the um, precipice of opening up Remix. I think we we change like we change what our our overall goal is. 
Um, but I think it would be to have multiple locations. How many, I don't know, but we, Steve and I have thought about this idea of having many different income streams. And so if it's developing other businesses along the way or finding partnerships or other way, other places that we can invest our money in to help other businesses grow, I think that's what our future looks like. And it goes back to architecting our own life and our own future is we want to create a cool product and create a cool company that curates these experiences for any customers that walk through our door. But we want to have businesses that that kind of allow us to live a, a flexible lifestyle that we can um, travel when we want to, or we can um, live multiple places. So we always say to each other, like, we just have to grind and work as hard as we can in our 30s so that our life post 30s will look how we want it to. But I know that we're driven to have a very diverse portfolio to use our money for good in the world. So I want to talk to sacrifices a little bit. And you mentioned it already just right there. I think when you start, especially if you're already working your day job, but yeah. even without that, if you're starting a company, there is so much pressure, so much, so many things that need to happen to to work and grind. Talk a little bit about that sacrifice. You mentioned it, but I, I I want people to to be able to relate and and really hear like what you went through in terms of, you know, not not hanging out with your friends as much, try uh, having to deprioritize time with your family, et cetera. I mean, we're still going through it. So I don't think it really ends. I think even if, you know, we're a small business and we are sacrificing many things, but like, if you're the CEO of a huge corporation, like odds are you're not making it home for dinner every single night and like making it to little league. And I think that that's just a sacrifice that all business owners or people who dedicate their lives to their jobs are that that's just, that's just what they do. They're sacrificing the time away from, you know, time with their family or for other people. But I also think that it's, it's a choice of fulfillment. Like I feel super fulfilled when I'm, I'm putting my, my talents to good use. And when I'm building something bigger than myself, so that's not always a bad thing. You know, it's just a choice. It's just, it's just something different than what other, some other people do, you know? you know, something that Steve and I say that we have got to get a better hold on is, is physical health. Like when you're in a food truck for 14 hours on a Saturday, odds are you're eating, you know, a greasy cheeseburger or something, or, you know, you're not, you're not exercising as much because you're on your feet for that whole time and you're tired. So I think it's prioritizing the things that are important to you and then making time for yourself along the way, which is a lesson we are continuously learning. So I can't even, I'm not even the expert on that. I just know that it's, it's hard no matter what. And what have you, like, what do you say to friends, right? I think family is easier to make, like help them understand what you're focused on, but friends can be annoying at times when, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have to make up certain excuses or like, Hey, like I'm just trying to grind. And, and some of it may be out of like jealousy or fear of missing out that, you're kind of starting this movement and they're, they're not, yeah. but otherwise they, it could just be, they want to hang out with you. So what have you guys, how have you got around that or, or dealt with that? We've been pretty lucky. I think most of our friends that have been pretty cool about it. Um, but I will tell you that, that not, a, I think not a lot of people understand it. And, you know, and I say that in the nicest ways. I love my friends. My friends have been so supportive. I have a friend who lives in Columbus and literally comes to every single one of my events. Like she has, is a rock star and I, and I appreciate it so much. And, and I think that it's, it's hard to explain what your new lifestyle is, right? You can't just say like, oh, okay, now I, I do this on the weekends or now this is, you know, I'm every single night. I can't grab drinks because I'm actually, you know, building out uh, you know, press releases or whatever it is. So I don't think people always get it, but I think that I, Steve and I have both surrounded ourselves with really positive people who understand it as much as they can, who support us as much as they can. And I mean, that's what you need. If you don't have people like that, I would say, then you got to just keep it, keep on trucking, you know? Yeah. When, when it comes to learning and resources. I know, I know jumpstart was huge and, and having yeah. those like face-to-face -face mentors was huge, but were there any books, obviously YouTube university, I love, were there any books or specific videos or people you followed that 
helped you either from like a founder mentality perspective for your industry, particularly anything that you would recommend to others? Um, so I would say if you're starting a business, more practical things to look into are, um, you know, look into your local accelerators, talk to your economic development departments, um, talk to your friends or anyone that you know, who've started businesses, alumni networks are really great. Um, but as far as personal development to just keep yourself on track, you know, there are some really amazing resources. Watch those TED Talks, you know, Gary V. I watch tons of Gary V. I listen to his podcast. I listen to how I built this. I think that the most inspiration comes from when you do hear these stories from people. And that's why I'm I'm so honored, honestly, to share mine on this, because if one person listens and says like, yeah, she did it and she wasn't an expert and she's kind of fumbling her way through, it's like anyone can do it. Anyone can affect change. You just, you just got to get started and you got to do it. Yeah, that's that's an amazing message, and and I think that's one of the things I'm trying to do is is break this down into bite sized pieces and and help be a little bit more relatable to people from the ground floor. Um, to, I'm interested to that quarter life crisis point because I've experienced it. I'm kind of in the thick of it now. I know a lot of my friends are as well. What would you say to people who are going through that? They're millennials questioning their their purpose, right? What they're doing day to day isn't inspiring. What what would you say you found in your kind of exploration? I would say if you're feeling any little twitch of doubt that you're not doing what you need to do, it is it's you know, and we don't have to get on a spiritual level here, but it is your soul crying out, telling you that what you're doing is, is not enough, that you are, you're worth so much more. You can do so much more and you, you got to figure out what that is. And I, I, like I said, a few minutes ago, I, I, I listened to a ton of Gary Vaynerchuk and he is constantly telling people like, what do you like? Find out what you like and like exploit the shit out of it. And he's right. I mean, you like basketball. Okay start a basketball camp or like sell Nikes or something or like, you like dogs. Okay. Start a dog wash food truck or what, you know, like there are so many ideas you can think of that, that people aren't even thinking of. And that's super important. So that's what I would tell somebody is like, figure out what it is that you like, and that is going to help you create purpose, but then do something every day that puts you in that path. Like read a book, watch a YouTube video, like make sure that you're putting yourself in the path of figuring out what, what your purpose is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and something I learned along the way, and, and definitely not, I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm starting this, is to your point, a lot of people start thinking around, okay, well, what can I make money doing that will, mm. will allow me to stop working my job, which I hate, and that's what I use to make money, right? But I think a, another way to look at it would be, just what do I like doing to your point and just start doing that and don't worry about the money because if any, if the last five to 10 years has shown anything, it's that you can monetize any skill or hobby or passion. All you have to do is talk about it or you can work on it. But I think wallowing in like sadness, I mean, a separate point that mm -hmm. I honestly would love your take on is I think a lot of the anxiety and depression people are feeling is brought on by their own mentality. I think people are causing themselves to get sick when they're just sitting there thinking these spirals of, I don't like what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm going to do, right? Those types of things. So I think you said it great is, is focus on what you're interested in and just start doing more of that regardless of the money. And then it'll eventually figure itself out. Yeah, I could not agree more. And I, I wholeheartedly agree on the idea that people make themselves sick over it. And it's like, no one is going to show up tomorrow and tell you what to do. The chances of you winning the lottery are slim to none. So it's like, again, you got to work for 40 years. Let's figure out what it is. What do like, what do you like to do? I have kind of come up with this mantra of like, don't quit your daydream, but don't quit your day job. Like <laughs> you need to have money. You need to explore what your passions are. If you're not, in, you're not already in your passion. So once you find out what that is, it's going to be a lot easier for you to take a risk and make that jump into what it is you actually love to do or whatever your soul's purpose is because you've had that paycheck because now you're using your paycheck to save. And now on your off hours, you're able to work nights and weekends doing the thing that you really want to do. Yeah. And if, if people can take anything from 
I mean, they'll take so much from this, I hope. But one thing specifically is you were grinding and that paid for the food truck and you used mm -hmm. that to lever up and then take the profits, flip them into Remix, which again, I've said this a bunch of times, I think is going to be an uber success. So if there's one thing that, and not to get too preachy, but if there's one thing people can do is try to reframe your mind around your day job and think instead of, God, I hate this, think every single second, every single hour day that I spend doing this, I'm just stacking up money to then be able to accelerate the zero to one path into starting what I want to start. That's like super critical because if you have no money, you can still start, but it'll take you so much longer to go the first few steps because you have to kind of like grow as you go. Yeah. Yeah. And don't discount the things that you've done in your past and, and blame that and say, oh, well, because I, you know, I spent my twenties doing this, or even I spent my thirties or my forties doing this, that I can never do this as a next step. And I kind of, I, I, and it's taken a lot of time to do this. So I, anyone who's listening, I don't want you to think that it's like an overnight thing. I've spent, I've spent years, you know, reading the things and listening to the things and tr retraining my brain. So it's not an overnight thing. Um, but I, I need to really stay le linear with the thing that I want, or I'm not going to be able to get it. And I think that, you know, it comes back down to find out what's important to you. You know, what do you value? If, if it's, if it's all of this other outside ancillary BS, then you're never going to be successful. You're never going to be able to achieve the things that you want. Amazing. So I, I have a couple, the last couple things I'm, I'm trying to start these, these two traditions that every single guest will go through. The first one is the, I'm calling the startup manifesto, which is essentially if you had to write a startup manifesto with five of the most important key lessons or pitfalls to avoid when starting out or to double down on when starting out, what would they be? Yeah. Okay. So my first one is find your superpower and exploit it and know what you're good at, know what you're not good at, and don't think you have to be good at everything because it will never work. So partner up, hire out, do what you got to do. But, but whatever you're good at, just be really, really, really good at it. That's my first thing. My second would be hire someone, your finance person immediately, whether it's have a CPA, have a partner who has a business background. It is extremely helpful. And only once you have that, you'll be able to, um, you know, get people to really buy into your idea. My third thing is the don't quit your daydream. Don't quit your day job. You need to have something in place that allows you to take on additional risks that make you feel comfortable enough that you can explore different avenues. And, and I say that now and in the future, you know, if I'm working at Remix full time, I want to make sure that, that everything is flowing as it should. We have a nice cash flow before we invest in something new, you know, before we, we take on additional risks. I would encourage anyone to collaborate with other local businesses. It helps you level up. It helps you expand. Um, your target market capitalize on the either social media brand that they have and the, the users that are already in tune to their brands. And it's just really fun. It's a new way to look at your, your product and, and really spin out the different things that you've created. So, so collaborate with other local businesses, other makers, other founders. I think you're going to see a, a huge return. And lastly, what I have to remind myself of every day is just keep going. Just put one foot in front of the other. You can cry in the corner for only so long, but you got to get up. You just got to keep pushing forward. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Those, that's great. That, that's a, an amazing inaugural list. And uh, that sets a high bar um, for, the, for the other people. The second thing that I want to make a tradition is this kind of nomination process. So um, it's your turn to nominate another founder that you know, that's a friend, colleague, mentor that you'd like to see on the show. Um, do you have one in mind? So uh, I thought of one today because this is, this is a company that we've collaborated with before. If you're not aware, there's a local company called Platform Beer Company, and they have, I think, three locations in Ohio, one in Pittsburgh, and maybe one somewhere else. Um, but they're an incredible company. They make really cool, funky beers. Um, and eh, about six months ago, they were acquired by Anheuser-Busch. So it's really cool to have, a, you know, what was kind of a small local company get acquired by, you know, the largest alcohol distributor and, and maker in the world. So they have a cool story of how they came to be. And I think that they would, they would be great for the show. Amazing. 
Amazing. That's, that's great. I will definitely reach out to them. Um, I, so before we wrap, I want to, I want to acknowledge you for a second. Uh, I think your like tenacity and just grit going from zero to where you are, especially with the Cleveland cookie dough portion, I think is, is really impressive. But on this, in the same sense, on the other hand, you weren't afraid to keep your head up, look around and be like aware of, of an emerging trend in what is, what is remix, which I think is going to be just a trampoline for your guys' success. So I want to acknowledge you for that. And I'm, I'm super impressed and going to be a huge supporter for the rest of the ride. Oh, that's so nice. This was so great. Uh, Vicky, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I know I'm inspired and I would bet that lots of our listeners are also inspired. If anyone wants to contact or follow you or the business, where should they look? What's your, what's your website? Where's, what's your social media? Yeah, so the best way is, um, our website is just www.clecookiedo.com. And on all social media channels, we are just at CLE at Cookie Dough. Perfect. All right. Victoria Cotris, founder of Cleveland Cookie Dough and Remix. Thank you so much. All right. That's a wrap with Vicky Cotris of Cleveland Cookie Dough Company and soon to be Remix. Remember, if you liked what you heard and want to support the show, there's three quick things that would really help us out. One, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. Two, leave a rating, preferably five stars if you can find it to do so. And three, leave a detailed review on why the show inspired you. I hope you enjoyed that episode and are looking forward to the next one. Until then, I'm Callaway, and this is The Founder.